Even by current standards, it's been a very busy week in the media for people involved in the ongoing debate about sex and gender. A book that tells children that a person's sex is assigned to them at birth by a doctor has been sent to more than 800 primary schools across the UK. SNP NP Joanna Cherry has challenged Nicola Sturgeon to a public debate on the Gender Recognition Act after Scotland's First Minister failed to define what a woman is. And a lesbian lawyer who has accused Stonewall of trying to have her sacked over her views on trans women accused the charity's barrister, barrister of bullying her and laughing at her during her employment tribunal. So joining me now, I have Helen Joyce, the author of Trans, When Ideology Meets Reality. It was a Times Spectator and Observer Book of the Year in 2021 and is now, this week, out in paperback. Helen Joyce, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me on. Now, Helen... Uh, this, you, congratulations on the uh, ongoing success of this brilliant book. And um, you might want to give us some background on to why you wrote the book, because this wasn't the sex gender area. That wasn't your area, was it, particularly when no, you wrote it? No, no. Um, when I came across this area, I was the finance editor of The Economist. So I was running pieces about bond markets and oil prices and such like. <laughs> uh, no, I just stumbled across the fact that there were people saying that what made you a man or a woman was what you felt like rather than just, you know, Yes. You look down and have a quick check if you don't know. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't believe that. It took me about a year to try to work through the implications. And it was when I realised that in the name of this idea, uh, children were being put on a path to transitioning. And in case anyone doesn't know, that can lead you to sterility. So they put children on the path to puberty blockers, then cross-sex hormones and then operations. And I went to an event where I met some girls between 18 and 21, uh, some of whom had already had um, hysterectomies at that point, and then realised it was all a terrible mistake. And yes. they were lesbian or they were autistic spectrum disorder or, you know, they had had childhood abuse or this was the latest social fad. And here they were with the rest of their lives ahead of them. And this is what had happened. Can you give us a sense of the extent of the problem? Because I know when, when clinics such as the Tavistock Clinic, which is the NHS uh, paediatric gender clinic, clinic was set up they were they had very few referrals in the early days that's right but then yeah. now it's grown exponentially and they're just the tip of the iceberg they see a few thousand kids a year but actually if you go into any um, classroom in a, you know a big city or somewhere like london or cambridge or brighton or somewhere like that in every classroom there'll be a kid who's trans identified they may not be talking about it to their parents they may not be talking about it to their teachers but they will be talking about it among themselves and if it doesn't go any further than that you think oh well it's just the latest thing about being like a goth isn't it yes but, you know, for some of them, it does go further. And for all of them, you know, to me, it's a massively sexist idea, this idea that what makes you a man or a woman is something other than just what you are. Like, I just am a woman. There's nothing I could do to not be a woman. You know, yes. I can go and get a PhD in mathematics as I did. I'm still a woman. Yes. You know, you're a gay man. That doesn't make you not a man. Yes. So it's massively sexist and actually homophobic as well to think that there's any sort of behaviour standard to being male or female. Uh, this, this is something that you really point out in your book, which I should hold up. Actually, oh, yes. I, think it's I very let you hold it up. There, there we go. This is trans when ideology meets reality. And it is a superb book. And I think what you do really well is you sort of a very, in a very accessible way talk people through the issues. Because I think a lot of people, when we talk about these issues, think it's a very simple matter of uh, equal rights for trans people which you were, of course, for equal rights so, yeah, for yeah, trans I mean, people. Yeah, I mean, for equal rights for everybody. Yes. I'm just not for people being able to force other people to say they are what they aren't. Yes. And it sounds like it's kind, but actually I'm really not sure what's kind about saying that a male person can compete as a woman in sport. Like, that's not very kind to all the women in the sport, is it? You know, there's already a competition for the male person to compete in, and we're seeing that all the time. So at the heart, what it's about is there is a, a contingent of people, and not all trans people, I should say, who believe that we each have a, an innate gender identity. And you describe it in the book as something like a sexed soul, which yeah. I think is a really neat way of sort of uh, uh, describing that. What they that. say is that that overrides your body. Yes. Well, fine if you want to feel like that. I don't. Yes. And I don't want kids told it either. So actually I was quoted in, in, in articles about that book that you mentioned, the one that's gone out to 800 primary schools. And what I said to the journalist, we put it in in full. I was so pleased. You know, I said, um, they talk about sex assigned at birth. Like, I don't know, you know, who's assigning this sex at birth? I've had kids twice. And yeah. both times, 20 weeks, I knew what sex the child was. Like, they yes. don't come out, you know... And have somebody go, mm, you know, sorting hat, let's see, is this a boy or a girl? Like, you know what your child is. Yes. And then to go to school, and when you're seven or eight or nine, some teacher says to you, oh, you could be male, you could be female, you could be a little bit male, a little bit female, in between both, neither, your gender could be a spectrum, oh, it could be something much more dramatic, you know, you're like, oh... I have to think about this now. And then, you know, what boring person wants to just be a male or just be a female if you could be gender fluid or on a spectrum and, or something? And all of this seems to be, again and again, based on 
old-fashioned gender stereotypes. Well, what else is there? To, you know, so that particular book, the one that you, you mentioned, it's by a chap called Ollie Pike, and he's very careful not to say how the child is meant to work out whether they're these, you know, party male, party female, both or neither. Yes. But, I mean, you're then just leaving the child in completely in the dark. And kids by now, they know that, you know, blue is the boy colour and pink is the girl colour and sparkles are for girls and football is for boys and things. So even though you are not saying it, you are saying it. Yes. So do you think that a lot of the problem is that when most people think about the trans issue, they assume you're talking about what we used to call transsexuals, people who, for whatever reason, feel deeply uncomfortable in their own body. They have to either go through surgical procedure or change the way they present in order to live a happy life. And those people obviously deserve sympathy and support and, and the rest of it. But this is not quite that, is it? No, it's not. I mean, those people, um, one of my friends once uh, likened them to sort of witness protection. They were so rare mm. that you could accommodate them as special cases. Yes. And most of us would never meet somebody like that. So that's one thing. But now it's a social contagion. Yes. And it, it, this idea, you know, we know this happens. We know this happens particularly with teenage girls. This happens a lot. Like eating disorders or, or self-harming, you know, cutting. These things run through classrooms. And their are ideas that some, if somebody didn't have the idea, they wouldn't do it. But now they have the idea, you know, you feel uncomfortable, you don't feel right, you... You know, you don't like, I mean, I'm sorry to say there's a lot of porn goes around the place in schools, like boys may show you things on their phone or in particular girls who are starting to think that they may be lesbian. That's such a porn word to a lot of girls. Mm. So they're, you know, they're, they're discovering who they are at 14, 15 at the same time as they're being made feel massively uncomfortable about it. And the idea that's presented to them, the one fix for everything is you might be trans. Yes. And that would resolve all of these difficulties. Yes, that's the other problems. thing is that, you know, if, you, if somebody says to you, you've got, you know, you're on the autistic spectrum or, you know, it's very hard to cure um, eating disorders or something, you know that there's a great difficulty in front of you and a lot of sadness. But mm. this is being presented as a one size fits all solution for absolutely everything. And there are all these YouTube influencers who are selling these most unrealistic descriptions of how wonderful it is to be on testosterone and how great they feel and... You know, adults don't know about this stuff. You have no. to look for it. There's this whole world out there where the children are teaching each other absolute nonsense. And that's particularly uh, troubling for young gay people. Yes. I know there are lots of gay activists who are very... They've basically come out of retirement to deal with this issue because there's a fear that effectively what, what they're doing here is erasing gay kids, and fixing and other, gay kids. I and there's think. other gay men in particular um, who are all for it. And I'm sorry to say that some of those are the ones who were in the closet during Section 28. Yes. And they've come back now to try to make up for that. They see this as the fight that they can fix. And they're also the gay men who don't much like women. There's lovely men like you, Andrew, and then there's <laughs> some gay men who really don't think much of women. Right. Now, when you wrote this book, of course, you... I mean, you must have been putting yourself in the firing line because it's such a contentious issue, whether it should be or not, yeah. is, is besides the point. But had you any idea of what you were letting yourself oh, of course in for? I did. Of course I did. Because, I mean, you know, as soon as I started trying to write an article about it, the very first article I wrote, I called people and I talked about it the same way as I had talked about every other article. And, you know, people have said to me, you know, you were, you were the finance editor. But I had been in Brazil. I had talked to corrupt politicians. I had written articles about things like the effect of pornography on teenagers or um, paedophilia and how you should deal with paedophiles, that sort of thing. And this was new. Mm. I would ring somebody and I would say, um, you know, can I just talk through with you the idea that, um, you know, what makes us a man or a woman is actually how we feel. And, you know, that might actually cause problems in certain spaces. And they would call me a literal Nazi, say that I wanted them all dead. As a first reaction? Yes, yes, okay. yes, absolutely. That was the way it was. Like, if you are talking to those people, I will not talk to you. Well, that, surely, as a journalist, that would make you want to investigate it more, wouldn't it? Well, it, it? did. But yeah. I, mean, I do wonder, a lot of journalists have said to me that they wouldn't touch it with a barge pole for exactly that reason. And I think, oh, you're the sort of journalist who'll run away from the burning building, aren't you? Yeah. you know, maybe go and do something else. Yeah, exactly. You know, maybe go and walk dogs or something instead. Because, because clearly, it's such a disproportionate reaction to say, when someone asks a legitimate question, to say you're a Nazi. It's yeah. so extreme... Something's being hidden there. Exactly. Something's exactly, going on. Exactly, exactly. So that is what interested me. And then it was meeting the kids mm. and thinking, well... Detransitioners. Yes, detransitioners. And that really was the moment when I thought, you know, because before that I was thinking, this is very interesting and I think I could write a book, but am I the right person? Yeah. Not yeah. so much that I was scared about it, but just... You know, I mean, I don't have any skin in the game. Yes. I know yeah. that. And I, yeah. and I have got attacked for that. People have said, you know, look, what's a straight, cis, white, blah, 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 blah. But on the other know? hand, you know, considering uh, the potential threat to women's rights, yeah. single-sex spaces, that kind of thing, then surely yeah. 
that, that you do have some skin in the game in that respect. I do, but of course they deny that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I also feel, you know, there's been, there's, we are at a wonderful moment for um, women's activism and general sex-based rights activism in this country. There's all these amazing groups that are <laughs> firing up, you know, yes. Fair Play for Women, Se um, Sex Matters, which is where I work now as the Director of Advocacy. I've taken time out from The Economist to um, go and do that. So it's actually very invigorating and exciting, too, to see you know, at the ground floor, a whole new sort of activism. Yes, absolutely. And do you feel that there is much that you can do with the kind of more, shall we say, histrionic reactions from the activist contingent, who still continue to brand people like you Nazis and fascists, but also send some... I mean, I think this is what has woken a lot of people up to the problem, is they've seen the death threats, the rape threats, the extreme dare I say, a very hyper-masculine reaction to a lot of this. You know, is that, is that difficult to deal with or is that something... No, that... I think it's brilliant. I mean, they're showing themselves up. Yeah. So I just, I also, I, I, I just, I treat them like I treat toddlers. Yeah. You know, I've had two kids and when you've got a kid who's lying on the floor, drumming their heels and screaming their heads off about, I know they don't want to brush their teeth. But... Deep breath. You know, and just repeat the calm mantras and so on, and then let them show themselves up for who they are. And so, in a sense, that, those kind of reactions might be the thing that helps uh, oh, yeah. this through. You know? Yes, absolutely. I mean, if we're just relentlessly reasonable, then mm. the relentless trolls show themselves for what they are. And do you think things have got worse or better since you first published the book last year? Oh, loads better in terms of being able to speak. But, you know, the, the more we speak, the angrier they get. I yes. think the only way out of this, as I think I've said to you before, is through. Like, you know, we just have to get to the other side. We actually have to defeat these people. Yes. There are reasonable people over there that we need to talk to in government, leading corporations, you know, in the NHS or in education. Yes. But the people who are screaming Nazi at the very idea that you might open your mouth. Yes. Just got to beat them. So just to wrap up, because I want, I want people to uh, be aware of your book and the new paperback version obviously is just out. What, so this is out this week, is that right? It was out last week. So there's, um, there's three things that you can do. You can read the book and um, you can follow me on Twitter at hjoycegender and I have started a newsletter.